Hello everyone. So I just wanted to say a few words of introduction here in this first video. First, uh, about myself. My name is Derek Moulton. I'm a professor based in the mathematical biology group here. Uh, this is my first time lecturing this geometry course. I'm, I'm really excited about it. This is obviously not the way I envisioned it, talking to a computer screen, but um, excited nonetheless. Geometry is a subject that I've, I've sort of written in the type to notes introduction. It's so ubiquitous and important that it's almost hard to find mathematics that doesn't have some connection to geometry, though of course some do exist. Um, in my own experience, in my own research, I've worked on quite a variety of different topics. I've worked on seashell growth, uh, kidney stone removal, the growth of plants, and in each of these very different kinds of problems, at the heart of it is always geometry. So geometry is always, um, it's just a fundamental, fundamental part of mathematics. Uh, in this course, we will build some of those fundamentals, develop some tools that will almost certainly carry over to many other courses and areas of mathematics that you encounter, regardless of which sort of direction of mathematics you choose. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we've seen two different operations we can do on vectors. We have the dot product, which takes two vectors, outputs the scalar. The vector product outputs a vector. The different ways that we can combine these operations, and in this video and the next, we'll look at a couple of those. Here, we'll start with what's probably the most common and maybe important one, which is called the scalar triple product. So let's let u, v, and w be vectors in R3, the scalar triple product is defined by taking cross product with two of them and then dotting it with the other one. We'll write this as u dot v cross w. Of course, there are different ways that we could order that, and we'll think about the order in a second. Okay, Notation-wise, uh, this is often written as this bracket notation UVW. And I'll write this, this again just so we're clear on the order. Uh, bracket U comma V comma W is the scalar triple product u dotted with v cross w. Now, some notes. One way to wrap our heads around this operation is to think about the cross product in terms of this determinant. So. I create the matrix, which has sort of a funny form because it's got i, j, k as the top row. And then I'm going to be able to write this in a... So this is suggesting that v is the second row and w is the third row. Well, as we saw in the last um, video, dotting... Uh, this determinant with another vector is really just replacing the elements of this vector in the top row, because the first element of this determinant is i, and when I dot it with u, I, I, I get u1, and the second element has a j, it gives me a u2. So this ends up being equivalent to the determinant of the matrix, which now has u as the top, v as the middle, and w as there's a cat interference, get off please. Uh, w is the bottom row. Okay, and so in fact, um, a lot of the statements we'll be making can be well understood thinking about properties of determinants of matrices, so keep that in mind. Statement two, the order UVW
matters, but only if we if we uh, change only two of them. So if we cycle the order, we get the exact same quantity. So in other words, if I imagine shifting each of them one to the right, so W comes up front, W, U, V, I get exactly the same thing, which you might uh, understand from properties of determinants, switching the rows of the, a matrix in that sort of uh, cyclic form doesn't change the determinant. And so this would also be the same as V, W, U. On the other hand, if I swapped, say, only the order of the V and the W, U, W, V, that is going to change by putting a minus out front. And you could understand that either by properties of determinants switching only two rows or thinking up here, this is the same as U dotted with W cross V. And as we've seen, W cross V is minus V cross W. So that comes out with a minus. And then we could, from there, imagine cycling um, with this new arrangement and the minus will just keep following. So that's the same as minus V U W or minus W V U. Okay, statement number three is quite an important concept, which is to think about when this triple product is zero. The statement is that uh, this is true if and only if u, v, w are linearly dependent. Uh, now, I don't know if you've encountered a formal definition of this yet in the linear algebra course. You certainly will. We've hinted at the idea of linear dependence and independence a couple times in this course. Let's give a quick definition here. So, for three vectors to be linearly dependent is equivalent to the statement that there exists constants C1, C2, and C3 not all zero, such that the combination C1 U plus C2 V plus C3 W is the zero vector. What does that mean? It means that I can linearly combine the three vectors to cancel each other out and give the zero vector, right? This is, they linearly depend on each other. Okay, so there are various ways of thinking about this uh, statement three, and I want to provide a couple of different views that, that prove this. So one is purely thinking about, about matrices. So if A is a matrix, square matrix, the determinant of A is zero, if and only if, and there are various uh, equivalent statements here. A is singular. Or another equivalent statement is if the rows of A are linearly dependent. Um, so you may have encountered these before, you, you may not, I'm not going to prove them, So, but this is just the, the idea that because the scalar triple product can be defined in terms of a determinant of a matrix, I immediately get this statement by properties of matrices. The rows being linearly dependent would mean that the U, V, W are linearly dependent, and therefore you get a determinant zero, which means scalar triple product zero. Um, perhaps a more conceptual way of seeing that is to draw a picture. So if I think about V, W, well, there are two possibilities, two, two starting scenarios with V and W. So, so 
One possibility is that V cross W is the zero vector. But if V cross zero is the W, sorry, if V cross W is the zero vector, we've seen before that this is equivalent to V, this is only true if V is a scalar multiple of W. And if V is a scalar multiple of W, then V and W are linearly uh, dependent. And if V and W are linearly dependent, then U, V, and W are linearly dependent. Okay, so this is sort of the boring case. If V, v and W are linearly dependent, and this cross product is zero, then uh, clearly U dot V cross W is also going to be zero. So the more interesting case is when V cross W is not zero, which means that V and W point in two different directions, which means that V and W create a plane, as we've sort of seen before. So the span of V and W creates a plane, and we've also seen that the normal vector to that plane is the cross product V cross W. It's a normal vector to that plane. Okay, so now consider the statements U dot V cross W equals zero. So that says U is orthogonal to V cross W, but V cross W is the normal vector to this plane spanned by V and W. So for U to be orthogonal to that normal vector, U would have to also live in the plane. So this is true if and only if U lives in the plane spanned by V and W. So U is living in this plane. Uh, but for U, V, and W to all be living in the same plane means that they are, in fact, linearly dependent. And you really want to convince yourself of that, of that concept. So I'm in R3, and the idea is a plane in R3 is a two-dimensional space, right? Two-dimensional space, which means two vectors is enough to describe that space, V and W. And so if I bring in a third vector, which is also living in that same plane, it's sort of like I have more vectors than, than I need for that space. And so one of the vectors must be a combination of, of the other two, and that's linear dependence. Okay. Um, another sort of geometric view of the scalar triple product can be constructed by thinking about a so-called parallelopiped. So if we construct a parallelopiped, made of the sides of the vectors u, v, and w. What that means is you take u, v, and let's put w, say like that, and you draw all the parallel sides um, to sort of construct what I always think of as a slanty box. So I take That and then I something like this for W. Okay, then I get something like that, which is called the parallelopiped. Um, note that if 
U, V, and W were all orthogonal to each other. So, for instance, if U, V, W were I, J, K, the basis for R3, then this becomes a unit cube. But for generic U, V, and W, this has this sort of funny slanty shape. Right. So the statement is that the volume of the parallelopiped is equal to the absolute value of the scalar triple product U, V, W. And important to remember that absolute value. If I didn't have the absolute value, then somehow the volume would depend on which order I took the scalar triple product. But of course, the volume of the parallel pipe, it doesn't care about the order of this operation and it needs to come out positive. So we always have that absolute value there. Okay, to show this, we're gonna do two steps. So one is to think about just two vectors. Two vectors form a parallelogram. So if I have u, v, I can complete the parallel sides there, and I get a parallelogram. The area of a parallelogram is base times height, that's sort of the same as for a square, where the base is, say, this length, call that b, and the height is that length, call h. So it's b times h. Although I've drawn it, b here is just the magnitude of vector u, and for h, what I'm going to do is draw a triangle here. I look at this triangle. So I drop this side down here. So this is this is also h. And look at this triangle. I'm dropping this down. All right, that's a right angle. That's the definition for h. Think about this triangle right here. Well, so if that angle we call theta, then the sine of theta, this is a triangle with hypotenuse magnitude of v, and so the sine of theta is h over magnitude of v, so that tells us that h is the magnitude of v times the sine of theta, from which we can say that the area is magnitude u, magnitude v, sine theta, but this theta is the angle between u and v. And this formula, magnitude u, magnitude v, sine of the angle between u and v, is what we derived the other, in the other video as the magnitude of the cross product u cross v. Okay, so in fact, this is a sort of interesting result on its own, just thinking about two vectors and the cross product. The magnitude of that cross product tells you the area of the parallelogram constructed by those two vectors. The volume of the parallelopiped can be constructed by sort of extending that idea in the third dimension. It's equal to the area of the base times the height. And so in the picture here, this is what we mean by the base. That's the parallelogram we've just worked out. The height would be this, which let's call that h to differentiate from this one. So this is h and this is, as we've just seen, magnitude of u cross v. To work out h, I'm going to draw another triangle. And it's the easiest to see over here. So if I extend this line that way and put a line there, this is now also h. And here's a triangle a right triangle, 
which has hypotenuse magnitude of w, right? keep in mind in this picture that's v and that's w. So if I define this angle here as, say, phi, then I'm going to conclude that h, in this case, if I take the cosine of phi, I get h over the hypotenuse, which is magnitude w. So h is magnitude w times the cosine of phi. But here's a key point, which is that, what can I say about phi? Well, this line, which is the height, <clears throat> that direction is the same direction as uh, u cross v, right? Because that direction, the height direction, is the is the direction that goes perpendicular to the the plane made of the base of u and v. And so u cross v is a vector pointing along here. And therefore, phi is the angle between w and u cross v. And that's the last little piece I need to work out the volume. That tells me that the volume is equal to, so I have this magnitude u cross v. I have magnitude w, and actually I'm going to be a little bit careful here to make sure that I get a height which is actually a uh, positive number. There should be, I can accomplish that with the mag absolute value surrounding the cosine, so for absolute value of cosine phi. Okay, but here this is a magnitude of a vector, magnitude of a vector, and the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So that is our dot product in absolute value. This is the absolute value of the dot product u cross v and w, which completes the idea that is, in fact, the magnitude of the scalar triple product u, v, w. Okay. Actually, I think this volume of a parallelepiped bed is a nice alternative way of thinking about linear dependence of vectors. So consider that the volume Well, I think we just say, when is the volume of the parallelepiped zero? So this is why I say, I like to think of it as a sort of slanty cardboard box. The volume contained in that box is going to be zero if and only if I squash the box. So if and only if. Very mathematically rigorous statement, the box is squashed. By squashed, we mean flat, and by flat we mean that u, v, and w are all living in the same plane, and thus linearly independent, or sorry, linearly dependent. <clears throat>